If there's one franchise that truly defined childhood during the 90s, it's Pokemon. Coming to America in 1996 with the release of Red and Blue versions, it spanned almost 20 years of games, TV shows, manga, movies, and merchandise, and is one of the few series in existence to bridge the generational gap. It's loved by millions of children and adults alike all over the world, and it's no surprise either. It brings that addicting edge to collecting things that almost everyone can identify with. I myself was part of this Pokemania when it began, and I'm still playing to this day. But now that I'm an adult with more mature perspective on the series and I'm on a constant quest for knowledge, I have to wonder, how realistic is Pokemon exactly? I mean, obviously it's a fictional series full of creatures that can eat mountains and run at 1600 miles in a day, but is there anything in the series that has parallels in the real world? That's what we're going to find out on this episode of Stuff You've Probably Wondered. Of course, since the world that Pokemon takes place in is an entirely different one, there are many different aspects we can examine here. I'm not going to cover every detail down to the very last hypothesis, obligatory Ash and Coma, that's why it's all your 10 years old theory here, but I am going to look at the biggest and most important. First off, let's examine the idea of evolution. In the games, when certain conditions are met, Pokemon will undergo a transformation into a new form. This, however, isn't evolution. By definition, evolution in the real world is when a population undergoes gradual physical changes over time to adapt to their environment. Now there are three main parts of that definition that make Poke evolution different from real world evolution. First, evolution occurs within populations. In the Pokemon games, evolution happens to individuals only. In essence, Poke evolution is really more like metamorphosis, where only organisms undergo transformations to change shape entirely. This is especially apparent in Pokemon like Caterpie or Weedle when they begin as a larva, then transform into pupa, and yes, bees do go into these as well, at least Game Freak got that detail right, and emerge as an adult. Another creepier example is with Paris' evolution into Parasect. It starts as a crab or insect of some sort with mushrooms growing on its back. With its evolution into Parasect, Paris is fully succumbed to the mushroom's influence and becomes a spore-driven zombie. The second difference is with time. Poke evolution takes place within literal seconds once the criteria have been met. For organisms in the real world, evolution can take place over many, many years. For example, humans' predecessors Neanderthals existed between 60,000 and 30,000 years ago. Finally, evolution occurs for populations to adapt to their surroundings. Usually in the games, the changes Pokemon undergo are merely to grow more powerful and complex, and while complexity makes up a big part of evolution, this is mostly because of changes for the better. On the topic of how Pokemon can change, let's talk about egg moves. Those of you who merely play the games for fun may not know about this aspect of the game, but to put it simply, egg moves occur in breeding. When you have two Pokemon, say a Dragonite and a Charizard, put into the daycare with one knowing a move like Outrage, the resulting offspring will be born knowing Outrage too. This can be immensely helpful because Outrage is a Dragon-type move and Charmander is only Fire-type. You see, with egg moves, offspring Pokemon can learn moves instantly without needing to level up, or even learn moves they couldn't possibly know otherwise, like with our Dragonite and Charizard example. To parallel egg moves to the real world, however, we'll need to step back a century or two. Before Darwin and his highly controversial but no less important theory of evolution, there was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Between the years of 1800 and 1822, Lamarck gave lectures and wrote papers on what would become the most famous of pre-evolutionary hypotheses. He postulated that animals change their appearance simply by willing themselves to change. A giraffe, for example, used to look more like a horse. When seeing the tasty leaves high up on tall trees, it willed itself to grow taller, and as a result, through many generations, the giraffe's neck as a species grew to its iconic shape what we know of today. Of course, evolution tells us that changes occur within populations and animals can't just say, I could while away the hours, confirming with the flowers, if only I had a cephalized body containing an organ that would make me more capable of complex thought. So Lamarck's idea sounds a little silly as a result. Or is it? Recently, a new field of science has emerged called epigenetics. It turns out that Lamarck's theory could actually be true because research has shown that some genes from parents can change midway through life and then pass those modified genes to their offspring. To understand how this works, consider the strongman principle. Imagine a bodybuilder who has been lifting weights and gaining muscle ever since he could lift a barbell. After several years of this intense training and his muscle cells having to rip and reform numerous times, eventually the DNA in those cells would realize, hey, if this is going to keep up forever, why don't we just adapt so reforming tissue is easier? So they do just that, and when our hypothetical strong man meets a hypothetical strong woman, the resulting baby will receive the bodybuilder's slightly modified genes, giving him the ability to gain muscle easier. Similarly, when we come back to our Dragonite and Charizard, 
we can see that epigenetics might just play a part in the baby Charmander receiving a move it couldn't learn under normal circumstances. Another physical property of Pokemon that will occasionally show up in the games is the aspect of a Pokemon being shiny. Shiny Pokemon are just like regular Pokemon, same stats, moves, and abilities, but they received a palette swap, causing their colors to be completely different. And shininess can be found with every Pokemon, even legendaries. The chance of discovering a shiny Pokemon in the wild is extremely unlikely, only 1 in 8,192. And that doesn't mean you'll find one after seeing that many wild Pokemon, but it's a 1 in 8,192 chance every time you see a wild Pokemon. In the real world, albinism has a similar effect. An albino animal is rare, only 1 in 17,000, but the albino gene can show up in any animal. Albinism and shininess share another detail too. The trait can be bred. If you find a shiny Pokemon, you can breed it to make more. In the real world, albinism is a recessive gene, which means it can be found in a person without the albino traits. But two non-albino parents with the recessive albino gene can have a baby with albino traits. Let's move on from physical traits of Pokemon and move on to something less based on fact. Pokemon lore. In each game, there are usually a handful of legendary Pokemon that play a part in the overarching or regional creation story and lore. The overall creation story of the Pokemon world is vague, mostly because it has been added to and pieced together numerous times, but here is the basic story. The universe started out as nothing when a single egg came into existence. The egg hatched, giving birth to Arceus. Arceus created everything in the universe, and most importantly, the Earth. Arceus then created Dialga and Palkia, which created time and space respectively. Upon the Earth, Arceus created the emotions of all Pokemon and people to come with Euxie, Azelf, and Mesprit. To create the land and oceans, Groudon and Kyogre came into existence. Upon meeting each other, they fought for a long while until Rayquaza came to be, ceasing the fight and disappearing into the sky. To account for the destroyed terrain, Regigigas came to be and shifted the continents back into place. It created Regirock, Regice, and Registeel to watch over these continents to make sure they never moved. Then to create every other Pokemon in existence, Arceus gave birth to Mew, who had the DNA of every Pokemon that would ever be. Then, Arceus, finished with its work, disappeared into the sky. Obviously, this story doesn't contain every legendary, but the whole story contains many excerpts of other origin stories from around the world. For example, the beginning of the story where Arceus came from nothing is an ex nihilo story, which means out of nothing. We see this most famously in Genesis of Christian and Jewish religions, but also Islamic and Egyptian origin stories as well. The battle between Kyogre and Groudon can be paralleled to the battle between the Leviathan and Behemoth of Hebrew mythology that would tear the world apart at the end of time. Individual legendary Pokemon are also references to mythology from around the world. Arceus can be interpreted to be almost any sort of deity with references to Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese, Shinto, and many other mythologies due to its horse-like shape and circular object around its midsection. The three legendaries of Pokemon X and Y are references to North mythology. Xerneas represents the Tree of Life, Yggdrasil, and Ivaltal is based off Fjorfilnir, which sits atop Yggdrasil and flaps wind into existence, and Zygarde represents Nyagir, the serpent that gnaws at the roots of the Tree of Life. Finally, Ho-Oh is based upon several mythical birds, specifically the immortal phoenix Fenghuang of Chinese mythology and the Huma bird of Persian mythology, which flies endlessly and can grant eternal life. Our last stop on the road to figure out the parallels between the real world and the world of Pokemon is ethics. This was an issue that wasn't seen at all in Pokemon until black and white versions. In it, the antagonists of the game, Team Plasma, go on a region-wide campaign to get people to question the entirety of Pokemon battling. They specifically said that maybe Pokemon don't want to fight against each other and are severely misunderstood. This plot point in the game raised incredibly unexpected questions for the protagonist. The whole point of Pokemon is to battle and grow stronger over the course of the game, so is it right? In the real world, cock and dog fighting can be found almost anywhere and is definitely illegal. In many occasions, animal abuse can become commonplace. Organizations like the SPCA and PETA try to stop this sort of abuse because in the real world almost everyone can agree that it's wrong. But in the Pokemon world, battling is a normal thing and takes place everywhere, so is it truly wrong to fight with Pokemon? Considering the plot of Black and White revolves around Team Plasma being a group of thieves anyway, probably not, but that's up to the player to decide. So is Pokemon realistic? In the five topics I've just covered, there are definitely a lot of similarities, but of course I only chose the most similar ones. Catching Pokemon, storing them in electronic boxes, moves, and abilities barely scratch the surface of the unrealistic aspects in this amazing series. 
But all in all, Game Freak definitely fact-checked themselves for the designs of Pokemon and the idea of breeding, if unintentionally. The point is, this game series stands as one of the greatest and most unique of its time, and it is sure to inspire many more in the coming years. It certainly has for me. Thanks for watching, and as if you have any questions you want me to answer, leave it in the comments or email me at stuffyouveprobablywondered at gmail.com. Also in the comments, let me know, what Pokemon do you like the best? What aspect of Pokemon is the most interesting to you, and what parallels it to real life? For me, I like Blaziken the best, and the Pokemon League is my favorite part of the game. Give me your favorites, and I'll see you next time on Stuff You've Probably Wondered. If Voltal is based off Viol... If Voltal is based off Viorfulnir, which sits atop... If Voltal is based off Viorfulnir, which sits atop Dragonsil, and flaps its wings into existence.